Very good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, welcome to join our Lost Day service. Today is the uh, 5th of November. This is our first week of this month. So later we will have our Lost Day supper. So hope you are well for the past weeks. And nice to see you again in person. And without further ado, I will invite our song leader, Brother Lemu, to lead us uh, with uh, worship. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Alright, for first hymn, let's sing My Jesus Fair. Words will be on screen. My Jesus Fair. Let's stand, please. Five stanzas. Ready? All those get now. My Jesus Fair was pierced by thoughts, by thoughts. From the fall, thus he who stayed the curse was taught to end the curse for all. No doubt, divine, no precious grace that God should die for man. With joyful grief, I made my praise. Good morning to one and all. We welcome you to our 
worship service this morning. It's the first Lord's Day of uh, November. Time is flying. And uh, we are into our second last month of the year. You know what that means. Uh, the year is fast closing upon us. And on the first Lord's Day of every month, we do partake the Lord's Table. And uh, it is always a privilege to be able to come together, uh, to eat together, and to drink together as uh, the body of Christ. If you turn your Bibles to James chapter 1, James and the first chapter for our scripture reading this morning, as promised, um, we are going to begin this morning a new series in the book of James. And uh, we are going to begin with an introduction to this book. And so as part of that uh, uh, endeavor, as we launch into this book, we are going to read um, the first chapter of the book of James. And as we always do, we will read responsively. I will read the first verse, you will read the second verse, and we go back and forth uh, in that fashion right through to the conclusion of this chapter. And we are reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. So James begins this letter in James chapter 1, verse 1, when he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exhortation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the, the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he bring forth forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, 
He is like a man who looks intensely at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word this morning to our hearts. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before You with a heart that is full of humble gratitude for all of the blessings that You have bestowed upon Your children. We are thankful that we have a facility that we can gather this morning that can comfortably accommodate each one of us and that we are able to worship you in a way that is undistracted. This morning, we are really not concerned if the government, the authority should come in to stop the gathering this morning and to disperse the congregation. Father, we do not take that for granted. We do not take for granted that we have a place that we can meet week after week and month after month and year after year, and literally decades after decade. The place that you have provided for us an arrangement that enables us to have continuity of ministry before you. We are thankful this morning for light, for electricity, that powers the air conditioning. That this morning we don't have to sit in the sweltering, sweltering heat of our tropical climate. That we can enjoy the coolness. We thank you this morning for those who are unable to join us in person because of sickness or travel. That through technology they are able to join us via Zoom. And all these things that has enabled our service this morning, Father, we, we thank you for all of these are your gracious and wondrous provision unto us. But Father, this morning we are thankful, most of all, for the wondrous provision of the free gift of salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that is the greatest of all blessing that we are so privileged to have. And if that is all that you would give us and nothing else, we would be of all people most blessed. So Father, we pray that you would continue to fill our hearts with grateful praise. May all praise unto your holy name never cease because of all the things that we will enjoy doing when we are with you, when we are reunited with you and with all the other saints who have gone before us into heaven. Praising your holy name is something that we will continue to do And in a sense, our worship this morning is but a rehearsal of that grand regathering of your people in heaven and eventually in the new heavens and the new earth where your people from every tongue and tribe and nation will gather together 
with hearts and voices united in one voice offering you the praises of thanksgiving and adoration O oh Lord what a sight that we can only imagine at this point in time but father something that we all look forward to and so father while we are praising you and while we are rehearsing for that ultimate day to come would we practice well would we rehearse well would you fill our hearts and minds with thoughts of gratitude before you that truly the songs we sing the hymns of adoration to you and especially this morning really turning our focus on the glorious work of redemption that your son has wrought on the cross for us we would sing with heart and mind engaged with understanding and that our praises might be acceptable unto your sight father once again we are reminded that we live in a world full of turmoil we live in a world full of conflict and all of these things really compels us to cry out unto you O oh Lord how long how long will it be till you return and we are as your word has commanded us to pray for your soon return for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ we observe that this world is just getting worse and worse day by day and the hearts of your righteous souls are vexing we are growing more and more uncomfortable each day living in this world we are thankful we are but sojourners this world is not our home but we are just passing through but meanwhile you have called us to be your ambassadors the representatives of the kingdom of heaven on this earth representative of our great king of kings and lord of lords and so father this morning we pray that while we are sojourning in this world we would be the salt and light that you have called us to be living lives that is worthy of the calling with which you have called us to live father we so often fail we so often do not have the realization that you are with us that the presence of our god is with us and the instructions from this book of james as we look and as we examine ourselves as we go through each of these instructions from brother james pastor james um, as we examine ourselves we realize uh, how far short we have fallen but we are thankful this morning that we have the grace of our lord jesus christ he alone supernaturally enables us to live lives pleasing unto your name he alone supernaturally enables us to live out our faith and we are thankful because there is nothing in and of ourselves that, it, that would enable us to live in such a way and so this morning father i pray you will fill us with your holy spirit that as what we read this morning that as we sit here and as we are hearers of your word that we will not leave this place 
simply having heard a message from your word, but that we will leave this place being the, the doers of your word. That the Christian life is not something that we learn with our heads, but that it should affect our hearts and ultimately the works of our faith would be shown through our hands. It is a living faith. It is a faith that demonstrates itself in actions. And so far this morning, I pray that you would grant to us your grace this morning to hear and to do your word. We ask all this in your Son's most precious name. Amen. All right, let's continue and uh, turn to hymnal one in your in front of you, 137. 137, when I survey the wondrous cross. 137, four stanzas. So this thing is seated. Let's uh, pray for the offerings. Our God in heaven, we really want to thank you. Thank you, created this uh, perfect world in the first six days. You created the air, the earth, and the sea. You fill it with all the plants bearing fruits, and you also fill the sky with birds, fishes inside under the oceans and the living creatures uh, on the earth. Everything you made is perfect. 
you given to Adam and Eve. And you want them to pass this wonderful word generation by generation to us. Due to our sinful nature, we create darkness inside this world. We make it chaotic. There are wars all over the places. But you never forsaken us. You wait for us to turn back to you patiently. You even sent your beloved son to die for us on the cross 2,000 years ago so that all our sins will be washed away. But today we still are in trouble because your enemy is never ceased. They created stress inside our life, financially, relation management, health related. So everything he's doing is try to keep us away from you. But you are always with us. Your Holy Spirit is inside our hearts. Remind us you are our final protection. We can trust you. We can have faith in you. We can put all our burden into your hand. So we are gathered together today to worship you. We come in front of you humbly. We give all our praise to you and also our burdens into your hands. And we trust you can bear for us. You can take care of us and give us peace in our hearts. So here we really thank you for everything you've given to us because of your amazing grace. We don't deserve anything, but you keep us very well. You provide us our daily needs. You make us uh, strong spiritually to face all the challenges. You keep us safe and peace and grant us joy so that we can uh, face our daily uh, challenges. So here we want to thank you for everything you have done for us. And you always listen to our prayers when we are down, we are in trouble. And we continue to praise you for everything you've done for us. So here we want to contribute back to you as well to share what we have to the lost soul in the world who are still struggling without any direction because they don't know you. So through us, we want to show the world your light, your truth, and yourself. So to be used as a vessel to glorify your name. So continue to be with us, to guide us, especially when we are at the end of this year and we know there is a very important event, the vocation Bible study. That is a very good opportunity for us to really to show your, to shine your light to the world, to the lost souls, through the children. So continue to be with us and guide those lost souls to our church so they can know you and to be used to also show your glory to their parents as well. So continue to bless this church, continue to give us uh, everything that we need to make things successful and to, for your own glory. So we thank you that you have done all of everything for this uh, small church and will always guide us. We praise all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen.
as I mentioned on the first Lord's Day of every month, uh, we have the privilege of coming together to partake of the Lord's table. And once again, we are reminded of how good our shepherd is in leading us, in guiding us. Perhaps you have come through a period of affliction and that as you um, think about what the Lord brought you through, you can see Let's just hold off on the, the distribution. Maybe we'll distribute during the examination. Yeah, thank you. Um, but that you've seen the hand of the Good Shepherd leading and guiding um, you through a time of affliction. Maybe you are going through something right now. You're in the middle of affliction and you are praying for the grace of God to deliver you from what you are going through right now. May the Lord really do show that He is that good shepherd to you, as uh, the choir just reminded us this morning. But the good shepherd gives good gifts to His people, and the most amazing and the greatest of all gifts that we have received of the Lord is the free gift of salvation. Um, I mentioned last week in our message on Reformation Lord's Day that we do nothing to deserve it. We do no work of our own to contribute to this free gift, which makes it even more remarkable but that if you have done something to deserve this gift, well, it is not so free as a gift anymore. You have to work for it. And, and I think in all of us, in our human instinct, we, 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 we want to be able to pay for what uh, we receive. Uh, if we are independently minded and we are, we, we, we obviously are not trying to depend on other people to provide for us. And part of what it means to be independent is that you are able to care for yourself, provide for yourself, provide for your family, and so on. Uh, we do not live in a welfare state where the government gives all kinds of handouts you know, to everybody and all that. Everything is free and all that. That's not the case here. And I think it is right that everybody should work with their own hands as they are able to provide for themselves. But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to this matter of what do you need to do to be right with the Lord, There's nothing you can do. We are helpless. We are hopeless in our sinful estate. And we can only reach out to the Lord and depend on Him to save us. Now, what that does is that it requires us to be humble, right? I mean, it is a little bit humbling. If you had to reach out for help, perhaps it might be a little bit humiliating, it hurts our pride. We who perhaps have such ability elsewhere are unable and helpless and hopeless to save ourselves. We who may have great talents and capabilities elsewhere to be so successful in our various endeavors are unable to save ourselves or the ones that are the most dearest to us. And so that is what, what it requires. It requires a heart of humility. It requires a heart of acknowledging that we are unable. And only then can it make this free gift so 
immensely wonderful. And only then do we not take it for granted. If you are drowning in a swelling river and someone comes to save you, you will never ever forget your saviour, right? You will always be grateful to the person who saved you. But sometimes, even as Christian people, we are forgetful. And I wonder if that's why the Lord has instituted this Lord's Supper and He tells us, as often as you do it in remembrance. <laughs> well, what is, what is the opposite of remembering? We forget. You say, well, I don't forget what Christ has done for us. Well, the fact is, we live in a very secular environment. You go out to work and you have your meetings and you have your appointments and you have all that and you get into that kind of a routine and we forget. And unfortunately, some, for some, we live just like the world does. It conditions us. And like Lot with his family in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, they're conditioned into the culture and the worldliness of their day. And so the Lord, in His gracious wisdom, instituted the Lord's Supper to remind us daily, to remind us as often as we eat this, of what He has done, of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, of what He has done for us on the cross. So we are told to examine ourselves. Where are you today? Let's say, you know, where are you today compared to where you are five years ago or even ten years ago? Can you remember? Are you in a better spiritual condition than you were seven years ago? Eight years ago? Three months ago? Where are you spiritually? Because that's one thing we are to examine ourselves regarding. James writes to people who claim to be Christians and he says, are you actually living out your faith? And unfortunately, we can only pretend for so long before we can either fizzle out or whatever, some things takes us out. We can only pretend for so long. And unfortunately, as a pastor, I've seen that over and over again. True faith perseveres to the end. And yes, there may be periods of ups and downs. But as we examine ourselves regularly, we need to, okay, this is where I am right now. You, are, you put an X, right, to mark that point. I was up here the last, you know, three, three months ago, but now I'm down here. Why am I down here now? What can I do to get back up here? You're always plotting that, 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 that course. Where are you? And that's one thing that Paul challenges us to do regarding examining ourselves, regarding sin and all that. If not, what we're about to do just becomes a real meaningless process. We just say, oh, you know, let's just get this over and done with. Let's get to the real stuff, right? But we have a responsibility to examine ourselves. If not, we'll be guilty of eating the bread and drinking the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. There is a seriousness to what we are about to partake. And there is a seriousness and a gravity in our attitude, in our spirit by which we are coming to this table. After all, we are remembering the death of Christ on the cross and the tremendous cost our Lord has paid for our sins. So how can we take this lightly? So 
in the quietness of the moment, let's do this. We will take our time with it. We are not trying to be efficient here. Yes, we live in a very efficient country, but sometimes I feel that we are just too efficient for our own spiritual good. Let's take our time here and examine ourselves. The deacons will take their time to examine themselves and to distribute the, the, the elements. And, um, and then they'll pray, we'll take the bread together, and then they'll come pray for the cup and we'll partake of the cup together. Let's go before the Lord, individually doing business with the Lord. Father, as we continue to examine ourselves, remember Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced for transgressions. He was crushed for iniquities upon him. It was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Indeed, he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our crimes. He bore the punishment that made us whole by his wounds we are healed. In Luke 24, 30, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, broke it and gave it to them. Father, we thank you. And that's really about, in this breaking of bread, Lord, we are coming to Christ in his presence. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. So Father, we pray, Lord, that our lives, Lord, will be lives where we, where we live in the presence of Christ, that Christ's presence be preeminent in us, Lord, in the way we live, in our thoughts, in our words, and this, just as in the Old Testament when Israel was um, let out of the promised land, it was a pillar of fire that gave them warm in the night, a pillar of cloud that gave them coolness in the day. They were in your presence. They moved as you move. And we pray, Lord, that we too, Father, 
will be in the presence of Christ each day. We move when he moves. We rest when he rests. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also, Paul writes that he received from the Lord what he then delivered to the Corinthian believers and to all of us as believers, that when the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Starting from verse 11, it says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh call the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God and with one body, in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also built together into a dwelling place for God, by the Spirit. We thank you, O Father, that it is through your blood, through the cross, that we can become one with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the same way, our Lord took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. But as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Okay, brother, let me lead us in the final hymn before the children are dismissed for Children's Church. Okay, let's turn to 267 in your hymnal. 267, there is a fountain. 267. Five stanzas, the children dismiss after the first stanza. Let's stand, please. 267.
Thank you so much, uh, Brother Lemuel, for leading our singing. And so it's good to see Angie on the piano for the offertory this morning. Uh, so wonderful to see even the young ones begin to serve the Lord uh, in uh, offering of themselves and how they uh, are grateful to do that. And it is a real... Uh, blessing to all of us to see that as well. If you open your Bibles to the book of James, James chapter 1, and you will see that uh, we are beginning a new series in the book of James. Uh, James is a very well-known book in our Bibles. Um, Many of you know about James teaching, counting all, counting all joy when you meet with trials of various kinds. This is the book that teaches us to be quick to hear, uh, slow to speak, slow to anger, because often we are slow to hear, quick to speak, quick to anger. We are the opposite of what James is teaching us. Uh, we read this morning about the warning that we be, not be just hearers of the word, but we also need to be doers of the word. Uh, this book teaches us that we ought not to show partiality uh, to anyone who would step through the doors of this church. We welcome everyone and anyone. So we do have some understanding of what this book teaches about the tongue, right? And how hard it is to tame it. It is such a small member in our body, but the amount of destruction it can do is, uh, it is not even proportional to the size of it in our body. And because of how practical this book is, this book is well beloved by many. And I think it is in part about regarding who this author of this book is. James, as you may or may not know, is a pastor. He is a pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And like many pastors, James was concerned about the genuineness of the faith that individuals profess to have. I would definitely identify with the burden that James has. And a big part of his letter deals with exhorting those who profess faith in Christ. And they say, okay, you claim to be a Christian. All right, you claim to be a Christian. Let's see you live out your faith. And if you were here last week, we actually, it was a transitional sermon. I wanted to you know, look at what the passage, the Bible says about, you know, really the, the, the linchpin of the Reformation, which is how can a person be right with God? How can a person be just before God? And we went to Romans chapter 3 to look at what that passage teaches. It really is the foundational passage that we ought to go to, all right, to learn about what the Bible teaches about how a person can be right with God. But if you remember last week, we also went, we also went to James, all right, so Paul says that Abraham was justified by his faith alone, and James says that Abraham was justified by his works, and we say, how can there be this contradiction? And we concluded that there is no contradiction because both Paul and James, they were arguing and they were defending different truths. For Paul, he is standing at the front of the door, all right, and he's saying, okay, how can you be right with God? None of your works can justify you. None of your works can save you. 
And then James is stepping behind and he's looking at the other side and he says, okay, you all who claim to be saved and you all who claim that you are in Christ, are you truly saved because true faith evidence itself in works, works of salvation. So these two individuals, these two authors of the Bible uh, are really arguing for different things. We will get to chapter 2 in time and we will spend more time in there. But you will see that James is arguing for a faith that works. For a faith that works. And that you saw in the title slide this morning. But we are going to introduce ourselves. Look at the book of James here, having an author. It may surprise many believers that even though James is placed near the end of the New Testament, because it is grouped with the other, what we call general epistles, okay, general epistles are letters that's not written by Paul. You have the Pauline epistles, and, and Paul wrote 13 of those letters. But then you have these letters written by James and John and Jude and so on, okay, and whoever wrote the uh, letter to the Hebrews, we, uh, we are not told. But actually, this is actually one of the earliest books, if not the earliest of the epistles, written, dated about 45 to 50 AD. And as such, this book gives a unique window into early Jewish Christianity. This book is written by James, who is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 3 tells us that Jesus had other half-siblings, James, the author of this book, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Now, James was an unbeliever during the earthly ministry of our Lord. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 2 to 5 describes how his brothers told Jesus to go to Jerusalem as it was a feast of, booth, feast of booths because no one works in secret if he desires to be known openly. So they were kind of like, you know, kind of mocking him and says, well, you know, you want to be known, right? I mean, you want to be so, so, so famous? Well, go to Jerusalem where you will be known. Yet James was singled out by Jesus to be a witness of his resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7. Uh, there, Paul says, then Jesus appeared to James and then to all the apostles. There is a specific reference to James and then to all the apostles. And we are told that he subsequently believed in the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1, verse 17. Now, having said that, there are actually four Jameses in the New Testament. Okay? And this James is one of them. I think most commonly we will mistake this particular James with the James who is the apostle of Jesus. All right? He is James, one of the sons of Zebedee with John. Okay, uh, and together with Peter, they form the inner circle with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that James, the apostle, was beheaded by Herod in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. Okay, so he was no more up to that point. But this James continue. this James who is then eventually, we will see later on, he became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he will preside over the Jerusalem Council. He's a pastor of the head of Jerusalem, pastor of the church in Jerusalem, and he will preside over the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. All right? James the Apostle was murdered in Acts chapter 12. There is also James, the son of Alphaeus. There is also James, who is the father of Judas, or the another apostle, not to be mistaken with Judas Iscariot, who disobeyed, uh, who uh, betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, uh, do not mistake uh, this particular James with the other Jameses uh, of the New Testament. As I mentioned just now, he became a prominent leader in the early church, pastored the Church of Jerusalem, and as you know, the early church began in Jerusalem and it spread out. So, to be the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, you know, uh, really you know, puts him in a position of, uh, of white regard. Now, shortly after Paul was saved by the, by the Lord, he, remember he was on the road to Damascus, 
uh, Paul record, recorded in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19 as saying that he had no contact with any of the other apostles apart from James, the Lord's brother. It is this James, the James who wrote this particular letter. Uh, Paul described James as, what, James as one of the pillars with Cephas and John. Cephas is Peter and John, the other apostle. Um, and it's remarkable that this James was not an apostle of the Lord. Remember, that is, that is the other James. Uh, I mentioned just now he was involved in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, where some of the people were claiming that in order for a person to be truly saved, he has to be circumcised. That was one of the things that they were dealing with. And in other Jewish practices, whether those were necessary in order for one to be saved. He gave counsel as to how to handle the issues that necessitated the meeting. And then Paul would actually depart from Ephesus. Remember, he was talking to the Ephesus elders in Acts chapter 20 and in 21, verse 18, he met James in Jerusalem. So uh, this James, the pastor in the church of Jerusalem, had really close relationships with the other apostles. Cephas, Peter, uh, and John, and even Paul, all right? And he, in fact, you know, uh, he was one of the earliest believers, that uh, leaders that Paul met with even before he met the other uh, apostles. Now, who was James writing to? If you look at chapter 1, verse 1, we are told that he wrote to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now, who would be the 12 tribes? Those would be what kind of people? The Jews, right? The Jews. And these are Jewish believers in the dispersion. What does the word disperse mean? They were scattered and they were spread all across uh, the region. And really, the background of this is when the church was started in Acts chapter 2 uh, on the day of Pentecost, all right, almost immediately, strong persecution came upon the early believers, and one effect of the persecution was that the believers dispersed from Jerusalem. And when they did so, what happened? They brought with them the gospel. All right, to the places that they went. So, if James wrote during you know, around 45 to 50 AD, he was writing literally 10 to 15 years after that first Pentecost. This is very early. This is very early. All right. Remember once again, I say that that James is probably the earliest book written, uh, if not one of the earliest. And his audience then is composed of those original converts as well as those Jews saved subsequently when these scattered Jews brought the gospel. And he also wrote to those whom they evangelized back in their home country. So here is 10 to 15 years after the start of the, of the church, the inauguration of the church, and James felt the burden to address the genuineness of these people's faith. When we were in our previous series, 2 Corinthians, Paul also told believers to examine yourself, to test yourself to see if you are truly in the faith or not. You see, this burden is the burden of any minister of the gospel. In fact, I took that particular verse and I spent three weeks on it. That is the burden. And pastors, ministers of the gospel, know very well that simply because an individual comes to church every week, week in and week out, and they even come in, in, the, in the front and testify of salvation, serve the Lord in some capacity as member of the church, does not necessarily mean that the person is truly a believer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the parable of the soils, talks about 
okay, how the farmer sows the seed. And some seed falls on different types of ground. Some seed falls on just the road and it just never ever germinates. But there are some seed that would fall into the soil and for a time it seems to sprout and seems to do real well, but when the root hits some rock, they experience certain trials and all that. And what happens to that plant? It withers. And other seed falls onto good ground and they bear much fruit. 54, 100 fold, and so on. Not every seed would fall onto that kind of fertile soil. And James is concerned to address, okay, you claim to be a Christian, and you may even claim that, you, you know, you, you strongly believe that you are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, not of works. Okay? Yes. Nothing you do gets you through the door of salvation. But now that you are saved, you are in Christ, are you still living as if there is nothing for you to do? Are you still living in a way where you are ignoring all of what the scripture teaches regarding how we ought to live? Now, let's talk about some distinctive that sets this particular letter from other New Testament letters. First of all, we see a strong Jewish orientation. Remember, James is writing to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. These are Jewish believers. So you will see terms like the way he uses, he says in, in chapter 5, he uses this term, chapter 5 verse 4. Uh, if you look uh, towards the end there, the term, the Lord of hosts. All right, that is the Lord of Sabbath. It is an, a distinctive Old Testament title for Yahweh. And James is the only New Testament writer to use this title. The only other time it appears in the New Testament is a direct quotation of the Old Testament, and that is found in Romans chapter 9, verse 29. Secondly, there is a repeated emphasis on the law as a synonym for the word. And you will see that. I mean, you see that all over. Uh, for example, in chapter 1 and verse 25, James says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and he's using the law to describe the word of God. If you look, so you can say it this way, if you look into the perfect word of God, all right, which liberates and, pers uh, and, and perseveres, all right, you'll be blessed in your deeds and so on. Okay, no time to look at all the other references, but I have it here and later on I, I will send you you know, the document which uh, actually contains a lot of these. And then there are also other Old Testament uh, citations and allusions uh, taken from the Old Testament. Secondly, uh, that it is a, this book has a very strong exhortational character. Um, and you can see that out of the 108 verses, half of them actually contain imperatives. What are imperatives? Imperatives are instructions, commands, all right? Paul, uh, uh, James is telling believers, you, you ought to do this, you ought to do this, you ought to do this, you ought to live this way, you ought to live this way. So uh, one commentator describes James as a quasi-prophetic letter of pastoral encouragement and no less of pastoral rebuke, proceeding from an unquestioned right of pastoral vocation and authority, it was most natural that James, as first bishop of Jerusalem, should address his charges, not only in Palestine, but also in their many and great centers elsewhere, end quote. Now, if there is a strong exhortational character, it is no doubt then that there is really an emphasis on practical religion. This is a very practical book. Once again, James was concerned that those who profess to be believers have fruits to show <clears throat> for their profession. He was burdened that believers demonstrate their profession by living a life consistent with their profession. So that's why, for example, in chapter 1, verse 26, 
He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, he is actually deceiving his heart. And this person's profession, religion, that he professes to have is worthless. It is dead. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans, the widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. James will talk about, a lot about worldliness in his, uh, in his letter. All right? Uh, chapter 2 and verse 18, he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. James challenged them. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. That my faith is validated and evidenced by the works that I do. This book is highly topical in nature, which is why it is very difficult to trace the flow of thoughts from one section to the next. He makes his point very concisely and he moves on quickly. All right? He doesn't dwell on it over and over again. He just, he may say a few things and then he, next, next paragraph, something else. And yet, many readers can immediately appreciate the point he's trying to make. And because of just how James moved from topic to topic to topic to topic, it is almost like a New Testament version of the book of Proverbs. And you know Proverbs is like one verse, talks about money, next verse talks about friends, next verse talks about lust, and so on and so forth. James also is a master in using illustration. All right, and this feature can be expected from someone who is a pastor and preacher. James is not an abstract theologian. He is... All right, masterful in relying on the windows of imagery, illustration, which throws light to the truth that he's asserting. And that doesn't come by, need, uh, by, by coincidence. Such skill is cultivated, honed by the art of observation. As one commentator, Hebert, sa says, Obviously, James was a lover and keen observer of nature. He was, alerted to, he was alert to the operations of nature and repeatedly drew lessons from that area. He was also an attentive observer of human nature. Um, pastors are keen observers of human nature. And especially, you know, when they have observed how people are over time, and they observe themselves, obviously, uh, most importantly, uh, they, they would draw certain conclusions. James also, through his illustration, reveals a deep familiarity with Bible history. And no doubt, he would have been uh, influenced, stimulated by his older brother's example. And who's that older brother? Our Lord himself, our Lord's own teaching and preaching were full of vivid imagery which evidenced his attention to details of nature, human behavior, and the common experiences of daily life. So the days and months and years of eating and playing and exploring and working side by side with his older brother, despite the unbelief in his youth, must surely have an impact upon James's own interest and development. Um, in my notes here, I have a list of various illustrations that... Uh, that, um, that uh, James uses, and I would just give it to you, uh, uh, a few selective ones. I will send this document to you, then you can see the whole list. In chapter 1, verse 6, James says, all right, let a person ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like, and now he's using an illustration, a wave of the sea. You see, that is from nature, the wave. Chapter 1, verse 10, when he says, the rich in his, uh, okay, let the, let the rich boast in his simulation because like, and now he uses an illustration, a flower of the grass. Here's an illustration illustrating, you know, just how uh, transitory our life is. Uh, and then in verse 23, it says, If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently in his natural face in a mirror. Here is an everyday object and the mirror illustrates the word of God, and so on and so forth, okay? No time to go through all of that. I'll send you the list later on. Here's another uh, distinctive 
which is a clear reflection of and heavy dependence on our Lord's teaching, especially on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, James, interestingly, only makes a very few explicit reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've given you the reference there. Okay? However, this infrequent reference, explicit reference to Christ is counterbalanced by the repeated reliance on the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And as such, what James is burdened to do is to show the organic connection between Christianity and the Old Testament. Alright? He is not unhinging the Old Testament and say, not necessary, only the New Testament. No, he's saying, you know, both are necessary. That the Christian life and message are not something discontinuous or disconnected from the Old Testament, but the most natural transition and organic outgrowth of the Old Testament. For example, he would say in chapter 5, uh, or in chapter, look, to give you an illustration, uh, 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 an example here, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, where he says, uh, Be wretched and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will exalt you. All right, that is taken from our Lord's teaching about those, uh, uh, the, the, the blessed are those who mourn. Okay, one of the Beatitudes. Okay, and I have a whole list here. I'll send it to you. Okay, later on. Um, let's talk about his theology. James is primarily reg- is commonly regarded as the least overtly theological of the epistles. Um, this morning, in your scripture reading, you may have read Paul's letter to Philemon. Who's Philemon? He was an owner of a slave who escaped, and his name was Onesimus. All right? And Onesimus somehow got connected with Paul. The Lord saved Onesimus, and he was working alongside Paul for a period of time, and Paul felt that maybe Onesimus as well, that it's time for Onesimus to return to his master. They probably had a discussion about it, and Paul says, okay, I'm going to write to your master, master who is a believer that he knows of all, you know, of all the people that, you know, is the master of Onesimus. And um, he wrote to uh, Philemon to say, would you receive this slave of yours back? And I want to tell you that now he's a dear brother in Christ. If there is any financial loss you incur because of his escape, you know, put it on my account. I'll pay you back. All right? But apart from that, um, James really, you know, is, 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 is the least overtly theological. Um, the commentator uh, Edmondson uh, uh, noticed, quote, we should not be surprised that the epistle of James does not even seek to outline all of the essential doctrine comprised in the Christian faith because, like Paul, he is addressing those who are supposed to to know the rudiments of Christianity. And his aim in the first Christian epistle, as in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the first sermon of Christ, is to set forth the theonomic life in its essentials, that is, life lived according to God's law. James' task is mainly practical to help true believers live up to their faith. All right? So James was not addressing really the lack of faith or what to believe, but rather the lack of practicing how to live out according to that knowledge. So, James is telling us, look, Christianity is not something that you fill your brain, fill your mind and all that about, and it just stays there, but it is how does it go from your head to your heart and out through your hands. You know, uh, we would say, Christianity is not just coming to church on Sunday. And even that, I think some people are having a hard time you know, doing so. It is not just coming to church on Sunday. But it is how you live out your life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday when you are not in church. The issue for James was not knowledge of theological truth, and I think in our church, 
I trust we will have a robust theological understanding of the Word of God, but translating the truth that they know and profess into daily life. It is, it is where, you are, where the rubber meets the road, where you are living out your faith. The explication and the application of the theology already held or professed. So therefore, the need was not a systematic theology for confession, but a devotional theology for living. And I use the word devotional in the noblest sense of the term, a theology that approach, a theological approach to life that would express genuine devotion to the correct theology that you profess to hold to. Now, that doesn't mean that James is non-theological in content or value. Every practical exhortation is rooted in, implicitly or explicitly, in the foundation of theological truth. So, what are the major theological topics addressed by James? Well, with God, James would say that he is generous. He is holy in nature and behavior. He is immutably good. He is sovereign in salvation. He is the Father. God elects. He is the only true God. He is the maker of mankind in His image. He opposes the world and the proud. He is sovereign over life. He is just and, un- and He is aware of injustice and He is compassionate. Okay, all, all of those I have Bible reference to, but once again, I will send it to you. When it comes to sin, James describes sin's operation, its dangers, its definition, its manifestations, including the variety of sinful expressions addressed in nearly every topic a subcategory of sin and its manifestation, all right, that he actually enunciates is the concept of worldliness. And we generally associate this level of attention to the phenomenon of worldliness with the much later writing of John, all right? And you all know sec- uh, uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, right? Love not the world, no, nah, things in our world. Well, James, as the first, one of the first epistles, was already addressing worldliness, all right? And... If James writes very early on and John writes later on and both of them are concerned about worldliness in the life of a believer, you can see how this is a constant struggle for believers living in this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We are living in this world, but we are not to be so enamored with the priorities of this world that is anti-God, anti-biblical, and so on. When it comes to salvation, he says that salvation is affected through the scripture. It is accessed by faith. In fact, faith is a subcategory developed in James. The noun, faith, occurs 16 times. The verb, three times. And then, when it comes to salvation, James equates justification via imputation of righteousness. Again, this is a little surprising. We generally associate this level of soteriological sophistication with the later writings of Paul. All right, we will get into that. We, we got into that a little bit last week as, as kind of a transitional you know, uh, uh, sermon into this book. Uh, and then when it comes to Scripture, it contains a three-dimensional theology of the word teaching about Scripture, response to Scripture, And really, you know, uh, James uses the scripture to argue for certain behaviors. And then finally, eschatology. uh, He will talk about final reward, final punishment. uh, And uh, he continues to, 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 to call believers to look towards that final time that we stand before the Lord to give an account. Topics, various topics. So, I mentioned just now that James' organization is more topical, less progressive, and organic, except organic in the sense that all of it sprouts out of the soil of how a genuine faith manifests itself. James consistently punctuates his transitions from topic to topic by beginning with an opening appeal to his audience. Usually, he will say, My brethren, okay? my beloved, and so on and so forth. He will, he will begin this way and then brrr, the instruction comes. Okay, so here is, I'm going to give you kind of like the outline of, a general outline of this book. Uh, as you know very well, he begins by talking about uh, trials and suffering and temptation. All right, 
uh, how to endure and understand them. For a Christian, we'll just say that suffering is not meaningless. I was communicating with someone this week, and you know, uh, he's an atheist, and you know, he was talking about you know uh, 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 how you know suffering has no meaning. I say for a Christian, suffering has a lot of meaning. All right, and one one of which is to grow our faith. He talks about hearing and obeying the word in the second part of chapter 1. In chapter 2, he talks about faith and prejudice. You know what that word means, right? We have the word discrimination and so on. Okay? The way you live out your faith is living it out in a way that is fair. Okay? How do you exercise your faith? Okay? And so on with the people that come in through the doors. Then later on, he talks about how that you ought to demonstrate a faith that works. So that's the second chapter. We all know chapter 3, the first part, talking about the tongue, the speech, okay, is power for good and evil. He's going to end with talking about two kinds of wisdom, wisdom that is from heaven and wisdom that is what we call worldly, worldly wisdom the characteristics of these two kinds of, of, of wisdom. And then he will talk about how when we come together, there's conflict, there's wars and fighting and so on, you, you do not have because you do not ask and do not ask because you ask amiss and so on. There he, there's emphasis on worldliness, there's warfare against God. All right? He talks about uh, uh, judging others, all right? the criticism of others. And... When you make life plans, which some of you are very into doing, all right, there is submission versus presumption. Okay? Uh, you who say, oh, I have this plan, this plan, and all that, okay, he wants us to think biblically regarding um, the plans we make. He will talk about wealth, the folly of trusting in riches. Okay? Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, You rich, you who are rich, and he talks about then the coming of the Lord, and he says, be patient regarding that. And then ending with personal integrity, methods of personal integrity, practical prayer, and converting the brethren. All right? So just kind of a go, uh, whirlwind through the theme. Once again, you know, uh, you receive this particular document. When it comes to the theme of James and the application, how would we describe the overall theme or burden of James' epistle? What exactly burdens him to write? What did he intend to accomplish? Actually, I mentioned this over and over again. James is describing what a living faith looks like. Okay? Have you heard of people use this term? He is a practicing Christian. I get a little bit puzzled by that. As in, there is a non-practicing kind of Christian? No, no, no. There is only one kind of Christian, a, a true Christian who practices his faith. There is no other category. Okay? Uh, as in, there is practicing Christian, non-practicing Christian. What, what is that? Well, that is an unbeliever, actually. And James is telling us a, a non-practicing Christian is an unbeliever. He is burdened to describe how a believer ought to flesh out an authentic faith and how to translate faith from profession. You come through the door and now you're in to practice. All right? From words to works. You know, how, you know some people say, right, you know, don't, don't talk so much. Show it to me by your works. Right? Some people, they are very good. Oh, I'll do this. You know, they have a lot of words. But when it comes to work, it is very meager. Right? Your army says, what, what the army say? Uh, what? Eye power. What? Um, don't talk, I can't remember. You know, it's been a while since I was there. But something about, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't talk so much. You do. So someone help me. You know, if you are. Huh? Uh, no action talk only. Yes, no action talk only. Mm. Okay. So, don't be that way. Uh, so, one commentator describes James as pro uh, providing tests of a living faith. 
tests of a living faith. He says, this commentator says, the root difficulty of the readers lay in the distorted conception of the nature of salvation by faith and its relation to daily life. Okay, some, some people think, I, 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 I'm sure, I do no works to contribute to my salvation. And after they are, they are saved, they also say, I do no works. They, they just live the, the, the way they, 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 they have been living. There is no change, there is nothing, you know, there, 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 there is nothing in their family life that shows that they are Christian and so on. All right? So, so he says, this is a difficulty. How do you validate your genuineness, the evidence of a life-transforming nature? James is not interested in works apart from faith, but he is vitally concerned to show that a living faith must demonstrate this life by what it does. Another writes, this entire epistle deals with Christian faith. It shows how it is that this faith should be genuine, true, active, living, fruitful. To state the theme is to express the application really at the same time. So the relevance of such a theme is self-evident. And really, if you look at what each chapter is burdened to show, I can kind of summarize it this way by a form of questions. Do we respond rightly to trials? And do we understand just how susceptible we are in ourselves to temptations and how deadly are his results? That is James chapter 1. James chapter 2. Is this a little small? Let me it's a little small. Okay, don't worry, I'll, I'll send it to you. Do we nourish prejudices that undermine the faith we profess? Or profess a faith that does not deeply affect our deeds and hence cannot save us, not because it's not good enough, but because it's not real. That is chapter 2. Chapter 3. Does our speech to and about others contradict what we say to and about God? That's chapter 3. Chapter 4. Does our relationship to the world place us on the side of God's enemies? Or do we betray a practical atheism, here it is, a practical atheism by ignoring God in our daily plans and life goals? You know, we come to church on Sunday. But do we live like a, no different from an atheist from Monday to Saturday? what we say, what we think, what we do, just no different from the world. The world does this, we also do this. No different from the world. And then chapter 5, do we manifest the patient confidence of past saints in waiting for the certain, certain, certain coming of the Lord? In other words, James is a plumb line. You know what a plumb line is, right? It tells you what is straight. For assessing whether your life squares up to your profession. Okay? And like a good physician, James prescribed medication to, to help us really firm up our faith. Okay? Is it really genuine? Examine yourself as we go through these things uh, week after week after week. Before we conclude, let me just encourage you to read through the book of James. He has five chapters, 108 verses in total, and it took me about 11 and a half minutes to read through the entire book from start to finish, the whole book. 11 minutes, 11 minutes. Is it a long time or a short time? Very short. Okay, you play your game, I think it's about four hours, right? Can you spare 11 minutes, 11 and a half minutes? to read through the entire book of James from start to finish five times. Monday one time, Tuesday one time, Wednesday one time, and all that. You know, it is amazing if you repeatedly read through a book and if you use a physical Bible, don't use an iPad or whatever, you, things will start to jump out at you. At your first reading, this thing comes up. Your second reading, something else comes up. 
and you will know that this particular verse is found on the top corner of this left side of this or your Bible and all that, you say, okay, this verse right here. You memorize amazing things that you usually won't. Give it a try. All right? 11 minutes. Can you say 11 minutes in one reading of the entire book? You can, right? Are you that busy? Not busy enough to be in the Word of God to get a healthy dose of what James is teaching. Once again, let's call him Pastor James, shall we? Because he is, that's what he is. Pastor James calls for a consistent and uncompromising Christian living, especially for those who are half-hearted in their faith. Like that. Like that. He calls believers to a serious examination of various aspects of their life to see if they are growing in these areas. You know, we talk about when we partake of the Lord's table, table, we examine ourselves. Where are you? On the graph of spiritual growth. Let's plot it. Okay? And if you can, if you, have a, if you plot the graph regularly, you look at a trajectory where you were 10 years ago, 7 years ago, 5 years ago, 3 years ago, 1 year ago, you know, uh, 10 months ago, half a year ago, and so on. Where, where have you been? Have your walk with the Lord, your life experiences, and so on, actually help you grow spiritually as a believer? Or have you seen perhaps some episodes of decline? Oh, by the way, get others involved. If you are going to be examining yourself, I say this over and over again. Ask someone whether they have seen you grow or decline in your faith. Because we often deceive ourselves. We say, oh man, I'm doing great, man. But then you ask 10 people around the person and it says, actually not really, I'm so sorry. Actually, I've been a bit concerned about you uh, lately and um, I, I've just seen certain things that is kind of worrying about where you are. We will say that we are doing okay, but then those around us may not necessarily give the same assessments. Get others involved in the assessment. Because we all have a tendency to wane in our fervor for the Lord and His work, we need to constantly assess ourselves, examine ourselves, evaluate ourselves. You know, you think about when you first came to the Lord and the excitement that you have for Him, right? Your first love. Where are you now, 15 years later, after that Damascus Road experience or whatever you may call it? So we can grow complacent. We can lose our first love. And James calls us back to the basics that a faith that is genuine is a faith that works. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We are thankful that because we do have a tendency to lose our first love, we pray that we will continue to examine ourselves, continue to grow, that you help us. It can only happen by the supernatural grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you would be so merciful to us that we not go into a kind of spiritual decline and not even have eyes to notice that. Father, for those of us who may be living in sin, living in some kind of disobedience, that is the biggest hindrance to spiritual growth. That is the biggest, biggest stumbling block to a life that is lived pleasing to the Lord. So whatever secret sins that may be, may be harboring in us that is really hindering our effectiveness for the Lord, our love for you, Father, rip those things right out of our hearts. Take away those things. Give us a heart of love for you that we might love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Father, your word says that if we love you, we will keep your commandments. And there's plenty here for us 
to look, examine and to keep. So Father, may we bless our series together. Uh, may we grow together as we look at really these practical ways we ought to live our lives, uh, whether it is in secret with our family, with, with the Christian community, and really with the world at large. I pray that you will uh, bless our study and that at the end of the day, may we not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Doers who depend on the supernatural grace uh, of yours to live out a life pleasing unto you. We ask all this in your son's most precious name. Amen. We are going to close with a hymn that perhaps you will be, i uh, pretty sure you are not familiar with this. Uh, 480, 480 is the closing hymn. Uh, pretty sure that we haven't, we haven't sang this before. So let's hear uh, the instrument played once. Uh, let's listen to the tune and then we'll try to come in. The tune is not difficult to learn. It is a real simple stepwise movement. So uh, hopefully that'll be easy for us to learn. 480. <laughs> stand together, we will take it a little bit slow just so that we can uh, be familiar with uh, the tune as we move through. Alright, so uh, let's, let's look at the words um, as we um, kind of focus in on a few things. Alright, from the beginning. Trust this prayer is really your prayer as well. And um, do you think the Lord will answer this kind of prayer? Yeah. Absolutely. A prayer prayed in the perfect will of God. Thank you. We'll be seated and we'll have Brahmington to come and give the announcement this morning. <laughs> 